So now what I want to do is I want to construct um, a direct product representation um, that is obtained by taking the product of um, one rep of spin J1 with a rep of spin J2, and then I'm going to calculate the characters of those two um, reps. So first of all, let's calculate this. Let's imagine I've got e to the i j3 theta. This is certainly one of the group elements, okay? And if j3 is diagonal, this is what e to the i j3 theta will look like. It'll look like e to the minus i j theta, e to the minus i j minus 1 theta, and it will keep going until I get e to the i j minus 1 theta, e to the i j theta. And I have noughts off the diagonal. If I want to calculate the character for this representation, so I'm going to call this chi j, what do I have to do? I have to sum all of those elements. So I have a sum from n is equal to minus j to j of e to the minus i n theta. What type of a sum is this? This is a geometric series. And what are the parameters of this geometric series? Well, a is equal to um, e to the minus i j theta. Uh, R is equal to e to the i theta. And how many terms do we have? The number of terms that we have is 2j plus 1. So I'm going to plug this into my normal um, formula for the sum of a geometric series. So I know that chi j of theta should be equal to. Um, so what is it again? It's a 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. Now you can just mess around a little bit. I'll, I'll just write down what the answer is. This is sine of j plus 1 half theta um, divided by the sine of 1 half theta. So that's the character now for this representation. What I want to do now is I want to consider a direct product representation and I want to use this fact. The character of the direct product representation is equal to the product of the characters of the two reps that I'm taking the direct product of. So my character will be equal to the product of the character for the representation with spin J1 multiplied by the character for the representation with spin j2. And now we're just going to manipulate this a little bit. So I'm going to rewrite it in this way. <coughs> this is um, e to the i, j1 plus 1 half theta minus e to the minus i. Um, J1 plus 1 half theta over 2i times by the sine of 1 half theta. So what have I written down here? I've written down the sine of J1 plus a half theta. That's what that difference is divided by 2i divided by sine of 1 half theta. So this at the moment is chi of J1. Okay. So let's maybe make that explicit. So this is chi of J1. This is the same as that. And you have to use that formula. So I'm using this. OK. Now I. Yes? Uh, um, sorry, what is your question? I mean, the post uh, term xj, I mean, the post xj theta is equal to a one minus r n. And that's time, a into one minus minus r n over, I don't know, 
Yes. If, it is a geometric series. You see, if you take a look at this, this sum over here is a geometric series. I read off the parameters of the series, and I'm saying plug it into there, and that's what you get. Okay, happy with that? Good. And now I want to write... Sure. And now I want to write down um, the second, chi j2. And I'm going to write it in this way. Um, I'm going to write a sum from m is equal to minus j2 to j2, e to the i m theta. And this, of course, is just a way of writing my character down. Of course, I'm choosing nice ways to write it because I know what answer I want, but this is true. And um, one thing that I should have told you is I am making an assumption, which is that j1 is either larger than or equal to j2. If that's not true, I would just swap all of the j1s and j2s everywhere. So this is what I've got. Now I'm going to split this into two terms. So I can put this as 1 over 2i. <coughs> um, sum from m is equal to minus j2 to j2. When I multiply that into there, I get e to the i, j1 plus 1 half plus m theta over 2i sine of 1 half theta minus 1 over 2i. Yep. Oh, good point. Okie dokes. Yep. Um, e to the minus i j1 plus m plus 1 half theta over sine 1 half theta. And this goes to j2. Minus m. Very good. Yep. Okay. Now, let's take a look at that last sum. In fact, that's the, the sign that I want to change. I am summing from m is equal to minus j2 to j2. If I change that minus m to a plus m, does it make any difference? No. Good. So that's what I'm going to do in that second term. I'm going to change the sign of m. So I'll, I'll just let you know I've done it by, um, let's see, we've got purple. So we'll use purple. So there, I change that sign to a plus. That makes no difference. So change m to minus m. Okay, so that's what we did there. And now let's bring it back together. This is a sum from m is equal to minus j2 to j2. Now, if I've got this minus that over 2i, that is just the sign of j1 plus m plus 1 half theta over the sine of 1 half theta. Now I'm just going to relabel the index of my sum a little. And I'm going to say that this is a sum from j is equal to j1 minus j2 to j1 plus j2 of the sine of j plus 1 half theta over the sine of 1 half theta. But what is this thing? This is the character of a representation with spin j. Does everyone agree? So what I've learned is my original character, which was equal to the product of a character with spin j1 and spin j2, is equal to a sum from j is equal to j1 minus j2 to j1 plus j2 of chi j of theta. And if I now compare this to this formula over here, I can read off these numbers in A. So what I'm told is, 
if I couple two representations, one of spin J1 to another representation of spin J2, when I reduce that representation, it's in general, it is reducible. When I reduce it, I will get each spin representation appearing all the way from J1 minus J2 up to J1 plus J2. That's the answer that you got from quantum mechanics by adding angular momentum. I think that this is an easier way to get the result. So if I coupled spin 2 to spin 2, what reps would I get? Not 1, 2, 3, 4. Each of them appearing how many times? Once. Well, these would be telling you how many times the irreducible representation appears in this given reducible representation. The Klebsch-Gordon coefficients would actually be sets of coefficients that would tell you how to go from basis vectors of the one rep to the other. How do you actually make the transformation, if you like, to the block diagonal form? So the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients would have a bit more information in them. Okay, so there we've added up some angular momentum. Um, and I, I hope this looked like an easier way. It really was an easier way. Okay. Now, um, I think that the last thing that I will do with you guys is we will look a little bit at um, SUN. And, and let's look at how do we um, get some handle on what irreducible representations can appear in SUN. And if we've got a little bit of time at the end, I'll even show you how you can take tensor products of these representations and figure out what irreducible representations appear in, S, in, in direct products of SUN representations. The idea that we're going to use is quite simple. And it's something that you, you're probably familiar with from quantum mechanics. Um, when you come to solving the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom is um, an easy problem to solve, and the reason why it's an easy problem to solve is it's rotationally invariant. So the angular momentum operators commute with your Hamiltonian. So that was the first thing you showed, and then you said, but hang on. If the angular momentum operators commute with my Hamiltonian, I can simultaneously diagonalize the angular momentum operators in my Hamiltonian. But you had diagonalized already the angular momentum operators, so you now knew that part of the wave function which depended on the angles, and you were left with solving some sort of a radial part to the problem. So what piece of that are we going to generalize? I'm just using the fact that if operators can be, if operators commute, they can be simultaneously diagonalized. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the... Um, the, the group elements of SUN, those are tough to diagonalize in general if I have a, a reducible representation. But I'll find a nice, easy bunch of operators that commutes with the elements of SUN. And I'll diagonalize these much simpler operators. And once I've diagonalized these simpler operators, I will in the process have diagonalized my SUN operators. Okay. So let's try to do that now. Um, so we're going to do the following. Um, so we're going to say, and we're going to introduce a little bit of new notation. So let's say we have an n-dimensional vector. Psi i. And psi i will transform as follows. Psi i goes into psi i primed, <coughs> which is equal to u i j psi j. Um, you know that that's invariant under S u n. The other thing which you know would be invariant would be this thing. So this is another one of the things that we discussed. Epsilon i, j, let me rather say i1, i2, up to i n. If I transform this, so let's say it goes into u i1, j1, u i2, j2, all the way up to u i n, j n, epsilon j1, j2, all the way up to j n. Then what we said was, well, 
This thing was anti-symmetric under the interchange of any of the two i's, so we knew that this was proportional to the epsilon itself. So we know that this is i1, i2 up 